brothers and sisters, could we please take our seats? Everybody that put an effort into Medigong put a really solid effort into it. Mm. That's what made it a success. Well, howdy, folks, howdy. I'm Jimmy Rogers, the last of the hillbillies. <laughs> We're broadcasting from night from 2MG Medigong up in the hills. There was a meeting held in Victoria, which my memory it was in the late 1960s, thinking about the need to have some kind of gathering so that brothers and sisters from all over the place could get together. I think a lot of us would have left if we hadn't had stand on tops and metagong. We non blank 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 ecclesias said, you know, we've got to take this seriously and we all start our own Bible school. It came about during the middle part of last century that a Bible week which encouraged more free thought and expression and new avenues for discussion might be useful in our walk. Otherwise, you know, the inevitable is going to happen that we're going to lose lots and lots of members. Ron and Margaret Mayer Walter and Jenny Pierce and Ted and Bev Russell. We made no apology for proposing something different from the edicts and rules being proposed at other conference venues. And there, were, uh, there was overwhelming enthusiasm for the venture. And so we began the search for a place to hold such a conference with living in quarters and meals provided. I think it was probably the antecedent origins of Mittagong, which was at Stanwell Tops. It can be said that Stanwell Tops was the precursor to the popular Mittagong Bible Week. 1971, I was 10 going on 11. Mum, Roger and I went to that. And from what I remember, it was the first school of its kind. I was uh, eight years old. And I can still remember us attending that. And uh, I remember you know, all the people who now have become lifelong friends, the Russell families, um, but people who've been large in my life, the Doors, um, Stan, Viv and um, Kevin and Olive, people like that. And the mayors, um, Ron Mayer, Ron Margaret, um, and the work that they did to begin a wonderful experience. I grew up. Um, at Shaftesbury Road amongst a very dynamic group of young people at the time and uh, we thought it was natural to be able to ask questions and to be able to <clears throat> think about our faith and and think about the things we've been taught. And it commenced in 1971 at Stanwell T Tops which was a I suppose to try it out and there were no international speakers um, but it was really testing the waters and to get a bit of experience of what it, what it would be like. Bill Stevenson from Adelaide led the first study week. The program included variety studies by brothers and sisters with special interests and innovations towards understanding scripture. There was a lolly shop there and um, so hard-earned and saved money, pocket money was spent. Before that, we only had youth conferences or main conferences, city conferences, and neither of those things were family times, and we never had a thing where you took your children. So at Stanwell Tops, we took Peter, who was about four months old, five months old, who was a third of our children. Particularly for those who came from very small ecclesias or from the country, this was a great opportunity to, um, to get to know other brethren and sisters of a lot of like mind and to do it in a relaxed fashion over a period of a week, um, which I think was, was a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful experience. The six committee members drove down to finalise our Stanmore Tops Bible Week booking. However, something extraordinary happened. Some other group had paid our final deposit. 
We simply prayed for God to help us to find another site. First Mittagong we attended was 1973 when we had two very small boys. That meant not being able to get to many sessions, particularly at night. But I remember I did enjoy it. I'm sure most of my Mittagongs were spent chasing Annabelle and Charlotte and Sophie around and trying to keep up with them. Um, but I was fairly young. I feel like I was born at Mittagong. Yeah. I feel like it's just... No, I don't know when the beginning was. My memories of Mittagong go before I even have a memory, I think. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be there right at the beginning. My first Mittagong was in 1987, just after I'd done my HSC. I couldn't unfortunately go in 85 because I was studying, <laughs> I was trying to study. Um, but I remember being in the old school gymnasium that year with all the girls. I have recollections of a pillow fight, but that, and it wasn't between the girls. I think the boys might have had something to do with that. For families, they'll allocate a classroom. And I think the windows must have had paper stuck on or something, so you couldn't see in. Well, we were in the rooms that were actually the cupboard rooms because they had doors on them, right? And then across the way, there would be these bigger rooms that had no doors on them and had beds in there. We, I think, just slept on mattresses on the floor, but the other ones had frames that I used to think, what do the parents of these girls have to pay huge chiropractic bills for, <laughs> for their daughters to sleep on U-shaped beds? Young people were in dormitories and that had its ups and downs. And Keith and I wandering around at night time as Kevin and Oliver doing too with torches, trying to find all those people that had strayed out at night time. Like these guys, I was only 15 or something, and they were like 7 or 18 and they go, you're coming with us. Oh, we, our age group just miss it so much. We just miss it. Kevin's auntie, Kevin's Myrtle, auntie Dawes, Myrtle Dawes, made all that jam, you made all the jam masses of jam. And her apple jelly is absolutely stunning. And she used to grow flowers, particularly for Mittagong. Yes. So one of the things you do is go to her place first of all, Pick up all the all flowers. All the flowers on the Saturday. And did all the floral decorations. Yeah, did the flowers. First of all, we had those huge classrooms and we'd get there and we'd shove and push the furniture and the desks around. I think the other thing that you were left with after all those years down there was a, a real love for the Southern Highlands. Yes. Because we used to go to those little expeditions to various places. And when we retired, one of the things we thought about doing was actually going down there to live. Myself and my four brothers at that time. Um, Martin was born in 1972. Um, we were all put up, housed up in number 46, which was a timber building, one of the dormitory buildings, um, just down from Club Hall at Mittagong. So we'd have all these desks piled up and nowhere to hang your clothes, and the bathroom is way down the corridor and it was freezing. And our family went into the big front room where girls normally slept in a, in a dormitory and um, it, it, was open, it was open to the air. And this was in May, so it was quite cold. And being from Sydney, we weren't used to the Southern Highlands. I guess I think of cold. Yeah, you because know, it's such a lovely place. Then we remembered how cold it was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you went down an outside veranda. But all sorts of honest conversations <laughs> happened in those bathrooms. <laughs> but you got to know your friend, you got to know a whole new pet group of people. I'd probably say, Mittagongs really weren't successful until you'd been to a couple and you were a part of the furniture, if you like. And you got to know their children. And I think that was a very valuable thing to be there as a family. So I was introduced as a teenager, so the first memory is at Mittagong and being wowed by the lovely white fence and the girls' dorm that we used to walk. There was a girls' dorm and a white balcony and lovely water fountains and flowers and just I just remember that lovely atmosphere of a beautiful school and being in Mittagong. There was the stuff that was around the school itself and, and the beautiful gardens and the topiary and all that kind of thing. Fields for sport, ponds for little boys to play in, the dirt workshop for afternoon teas, um, club hall was an amazing hall for everyone to be in. It was in the spring, it was still cold but you know, the blossoms came out and even though you were rugged up and you know, sometimes there was an iris out, which I think is one of the school emblems. Yeah. 
Prissy at two decided to cross Range Road by herself and someone brought her back. That was extremely embarrassing. There was plenty of opportunity to go exploring and it was a bit of a, you know, like a famous five type adventure down there. And I think as children, maybe I'm, um, I'm sort of glorifying, romanticizing this, yeah, romanticizing this. I do believe we did spend a bit of time down there, a bit of hijinks. Mittagong enabled the people who were there to grow, I think, very quickly spiritually. It must have been a high-protein diet. There's been an opportunity to regroup afterwards and want to keep that connection, a community connection, through prayer groups starting up after Mittagong. I think that's been a very important thing for me. When we were left kind of desperate, lying on the land, saying, what's happened to us? These lovely brethren um, organised Stanwell Tops and said if we stand for something um, then we should speak out about it. So the Believer magazine started and, that, and, and <coughs> Stanwell Tops started. Tiana was probably a bit inspired yes, by Mittagong. Frank and Paul and Inkster were sort of driving forces and uh, at somewhere, somewhere along the line I kind of became the secretary. There are some women who are fabulous Bible students, by the way, that have been through Metagong and Armadale. It enabled them to be able to do that, which was, I just loved going and hear, hearing them. Bob Collins from Queensland attended the Stanwell Tops Week and found such inspiration in the experience that he took the idea back to Queensland. Bob Collins, my uncle, came down with some other people from Brisbane to get the hang of what you can do to start um, Shannon Park. One of the things which I think eventually grew out of the Mittagong Top movement were the seminars, where we actually got more honest about our faith um, and said that there were some things that all of us are struggling with that we're not allowed to talk about. And so the seminars eventually, so some of the <clears throat> variety studies got much more personal, much more interactive, and now at Armadale, that's, that's moved the TED talk. On Monday evenings, we selected a number of people and sat them down with someone to interview them, and they were terrific nights. And we found that the whole mood of Metagong changed once we'd done the Monday night thing. And I was asked to interview Siegfried Merrill, and... Um, I went through the interview and got to know Siegfried and became good friends with uh, Siegfried and Susan after that. And again, without Mittagong, that would have never happened. At Mittagong 87, I did a variety study about campaigning and what followed from on from there was quite a few campaigns which we did around New South Wales. We actually introduced the Bible to a lot of people with our little exhibition that we had, using also the exhibition truck from Queensland. Uh, the Bible exhibition developed a little bit too as a result of some thoughts at Mittagong. I think we had the, the exhibition down there one time. Women at the Well actually grew out of that. At that stage, we were very excited about the word grace. That was part of that kind of everyone has a voice, everyone's worth hearing. Everybody has a relationship with God that they own that's totally theirs. I think that also came out of Mittagong. The newsletter, French and Folio, which usually was delivered at, the, at breakfast. They used to go and, apart from probably having some prepared base material, they'd be finding all the funny things and uh, beautiful quotable quotes that people had during the week. So I remember going to one of the studies and it was very dark and he tells us to look up the Bible and I think I remember getting ribbed because I made this comment that it would be okay if my Bible was in Braille, but I had no chance of being actually being able to read it. I think that got quoted in the newspaper the next morning from the French folio. So I kind of got bagged out that for the, the week, but like, I don't know how they expect you to read when you can't even see the words on the page. Maybe the conversation's got a bit dull. Maybe you want to meet somebody else. When I was younger, I enjoyed reading that. Uh, it was put out on the table at breakfast. In 2001, French and Folio became digitised and was shown at night after the sessions were finished. I'm only going to say this once to you, just once. Hey, I'm a set of common nights, get the right slate, much good. I want to see my way, I'm going to call some of my tricks, Jack, and I'm going to play. The young children 
would often took part in the making of that video and lined up at the hall um, after they'd finished their sessions at night so they could come in and watch what they'd done that day. Roger David Lab. you know who he is? You don't know who he is? Well, I do Lab? remember the folio. Yeah, it used to come out every morning for breakfast. Yeah, I think we, we, we I can remember feeding some yeah, information. Yeah, feeding the information. But I don't even know where they ran it off. It was done on a Gestetner or something. Well, yeah, it was in that office part, I think. Yeah, in the office. Folio TV came up. Uh, that was a lot of fun for the kids to, to be watching every night. <laughs> That's it! I've got it! That's it! Mark that one in! And I think everybody was just waiting, waiting for it to happen. I'm preparing here some nice food for tonight for everyone here at French, but you've got to be so careful because. Uh... Oh, hi, Greta! Ah! And of course, Daniel's Den is on tonight for all 15 plus. Everyone's welcome, and it's a great opportunity to let loose. Um, the gorilla was huge. <laughs> now, we've had reports a few hours ago that the gorilla has been sighted. That was. Went and what off. was. What was Mitigong, was it Mitigong TV? What was it called? Folio TV. Oh, that TV. was so That good. was iconic. <laughs> Barbie. There's no such thing as Barbie Pierce, it's Britney Spears. There were animals roaming around the school. I remember one being a gorilla. <laughs> Panda. Happiness is like a never-ending bamboo shoot. I keep going! And a cow. So um, that provided some entertainment during the afternoon probably when things were free and on folio TV at night which became FTV. Flying from England was becoming much easier. It was the opportunity to bring to Australia speakers that we'd only known as names in the past. It's a talk where you hear him speak and he speaks as a person who's, who's saying something but wishes he could say more. And he laboriously put that thing together and along came the learned rabbit. And Eeyore the donkey said to rabbit the learned, what's that? Three sticks, said rabbit. That, said Eeyore, is an A, a great and glorious A. He was learning his alphabet. And Rabbit said, no, three sticks. So Eeyore stamped on his three sticks. He said, what good is education? And then he jumped on his six sticks and said, learning, nonsense, and threw his 12 sticks away. <laughs> well, that's the parable. Now, what's that? And if you dare to say that's just an elbow stuck on the bench with my arm raised above it, looking particularly stupid, I shall stamp on it. For that is an I, the great and glorious I, the perpendicular pronoun. That is the most important person in the world, that's me. He sat on the edge of the stage so his legs were dangling. It used to take about half an hour to get your brain into gear to keep up with his speech. <laughs> he was so fast. A.D. Norris was probably someone who was just, he had an incredible insight into scripture. Kevin Dawes, who I'd grown up with with Stride, um, was greatly loves the Gospel of John and um, I just loved that exploration that he made. I think one of the nicest guys that came to was Peter Banford. Yeah, he was, he, a was really, soul, he was a lovely he? guy. You know, and he gave a talk on Judas, I think it was an excitation that still sticks in my mind. And we think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when in that last important meeting with his disciples before his crucifixion that John records. He said, this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. I said to uh, Brother Harry Hawking, you know, I shall always remember you, Harry. 
coming in the morning with a tray and a pink dressing gown. Like Harry Tennant was an amazing speaker. And I, I've also, you know, if you look, if you listen back at his talks, he was just a brilliant storyteller. He spoke about Romans and I got copies of the cassettes and I got a cassette player stuck in my car and I could, I reckon, almost recite um, those talks that he did on Romans. According to the word, and he's right back to that wonderful word, the word that said that God, God himself was gracious, abundant in goodness and truth. He said, let your power be great and forgive. And the power of God is his forgiveness. The following year, in 1982, he spoke at the Emu Park Bible Week up at Yapoon. And um, that year as well, earlier that year, I got baptised. And I remember, I mean, Harry Whittaker, so with his sand shoes on, standing on the edge. Do you remember that? Standing on the edge of the, the uh, stage with this Little Bible. Bible about this big, you yeah. know, and just going on non-stop with a great talk, you know. Please, let's be clear on this. I'm hoping, I'm rather expecting, that you will be listening with critical minds. Uh, those who like swallowing anything hook, line and sinker are, have come to the wrong session. 40 years he ministers to Judah. This is the end time for them. This is, as it were, the last generation as the prophet speaks to them. Five kings remain, including Josiah, and he now warns them that there is no more negotiation. Men of faith take the long view. They look with a long perspective and see the providential care of God disturbing, provoking and bearing his people forward. You could almost put it in the context of Ecclesiastes, a time for the one and a time for the other. A time now for the overview, for the sort of general survey, putting it into perspective, putting it into context. Where does Ecclesiastes fit in scripture? Try and have the, the main speaker as being an international speaker mm. and then all the support speakers being local. I think we had some occasions when some of the supports were also from outside the country, but generally speaking, try and foster the local speakers too. Mm -hmm. Moses, you need to um, delegate your authority. And he set up a number of people to hear some of the minor cases, and he was left free to deal with the more serious cases. I often wondered where Jethro got his experience from to offer that advice but I notice that we're specifically told that he had seven daughters. <laughs> Amos may have been a street corner preacher but what he had to say on the street corner was carefully structured. That roll call of nations in chapters 1 and chapter 2 Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab He's not a casual ramble around the borders of Israel. I do remember some speakers. I remember Alfred Norris. Yes. I remember my darling father-in-law. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 gives us a warning. It says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I remember Duncan Heaster. Really, to project your voice so that people could hear. And he really had to stand up, but he sits down. And I think this is, uh, I think, purposeful. The one thing was to get people to get to near, as near to him as possible in order to understand his word. And I think that's a lesson in itself that uh, we can be Bible-centered, but not Christ-centered. He wants people to be focused upon him as a person. And to come and sit and listen to talks is not my number one priority. Each time I go, I sort of think, no, and that's going to be my last one. And um, somehow we go again. And it's just been the best holiday we have. It was considered good practice to tell the students what you were going to tell them. And then to tell them. And then to tell them what you've told them. I noticed how he had scrubbed out and changed almost everything on each page of his notes. There are two things that I will take back with me when I go back. The first one is, good day, mate. 
And the second one, for all my efforts, no worries, mate. <laughs> Thanks. Then other people would say, oh, have you heard brother such and such? Mm. People have been over to the UK or wherever it had been. And I think like Anthony Eustace and we got out from South Africa and so forth. So gradually you got names thrown at you. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Some of them were very surprising. I mean, Anthony says it was a surprise because we didn't really know very much about him. And he gave very good talks, as we know. But he, he put on, on the variety night, he put on that time when he, he, he took off all the speakers and <laughs> first Mansfield. I'll just bring him, he's been waiting a long time actually. I'm sorry I've been slow in calling him. I'll just get him. There are certain matters that I desire to bring unto your notice <laughs> this evening concerning Nicholas Knox of Nottingham. It was just hilarious with the things he was doing. In fact, some people in front of us were almost rolling on the ground with laughter. One of the legacies of Middlegong, right, that there was these amazing speakers who probably gave some of their, you know, maybe some of their best work ever. We're actually a fairly dynamic, fluid organisation. We want to pretend that we're stuck in the mud, but we've changed over time and you need these places to have the conversation or where we're going, how we're going to get there, or just different insights. I never thought about how this was going to be like this. It's an opportunity to get to know people's kids and I, I really love getting to know the kids and be able to you know, have a conversation with them out, you know, during the week. I mean, when you think about it, <laughs> we used to leave them in their room asleep. The little ones, the really little ones, or you'd have them on the floor, we'd all have on the floor. But we kind of did it because it was all worth being there and you didn't want to stay back. It was a different phase of our lives. Like, Mittagong was like, where the little kids were running around smelling the flowers, and Armadale was like, where the little rat bags that do random yeah stuff. You know, chasing people down alleyways and falling <laughs> and over And laughing at the same time. The same See, time. It, was, it was terrible. You were trying to be <laughs> so proper, yeah. and yet... I wasn't really involved in a lot of the shenanigans that the uh, Henrys and their tools used to injure. Instigate. You just have to experience it. It's just so, the vibes are immaculate. immaculate. Like, there's just nothing I think, really. I think what I always find is you always, you rock up. There's just like a random conglomerate of people. Mm. And then by the end of the week, you're, you're best mate. Soul bonded. Yeah. <laughs> Playing with other people's kids. David, we've got some great photos of you with our kids. We played sport, we did the things. I remember the girls having a great time doing their craft. There were a lot of fun times held down in the gym, Daniel's Den down in the gym. I can't remember so much um, Noah's Ark myself, but um, I can remember being in Jacob's Ladder and then moving as you got older to um, Daniel's Den. And um, we got up to pretty good antics in Daniel's Den. Usually, and it still is this way, it's, it's more of a time to sort of have a bit more fun at the end of the day. Peter Tyrrell did it, all wonderful the, woodwork with all, all the boys. Yeah. I remember the little old classrooms, it was down the hill from the hall, and the, the boys were quite clingy, I suppose. So we'd spend quite a bit of time there, and you know, Robin would be on Grandma Judy, and aunties would be on Judy to sort of hang around with the boys a bit. And obviously they were very familiar with our friends as parents. But it was a great opportunity to drop your kids in. You knew they were safe, they were having fun activities, or you were down there getting to know other people's kids better, which was a really special time. Talking to one of our girls who said she has such strong, happy memories of all kinds of things at um, Mittagong. So I remember the noise of the dining room. Once lunch got started, it was just this buzz of everyone chatting and catching up with people they haven't seen in ages. And in the afternoons, we used to go, we used to walk up the gym, couldn't do that now. Big hike every Sunday, you know, the first Sunday every Mittagong, we'd be 
hiking up to the jib and um, that was always a wonderful, lovely way to spend the first afternoon. A hill, a big hill between Mittagong and the town of Barrel, just beyond, and uh, that would take, you know, the whole afternoon. A lovely day was held today with the uh, hike up the jib, our most successful hike ever. Uh, with over 95% particip of participants actually returning. The jib. The jib, up yeah, to the top of the jib. Right. That was always great fun too, just to, the whole group to go up to the jib and back. Start having a chat and um, it was probably about three or four kilometres up the hill. And uh, then we'd all get up the top and someone would bring up afternoon tea in the car. Um, but the things I like best about Mittagong and uh, Armadale now is that sense of the broad cross-section of community from the whole gamut of humanity of the little children to the elderly and having the opportunity and making deliberate steps to talk to people particularly if you see someone that's a little bit isolated or if you're a little bit isolated and someone comes over and starts a conversation with you that's really quite lovely. Yeah I used to come home from Mittagong quite exhausted but I think with most Bible schools like that, you come home tired yeah, because you do. you do sit around and chat. And, yes. and it's the fact of talking all the time. It does feel very, there's a lot of new ideas going on. Yeah, and just a real openness. Um, Uncle Bill, um, this I think was behind the this concept of Philemon, the spirit message in Philemon about refresh my heart. And um, to me, that's the foundation of what the the value and the the values of this week are. It's like, my brother Martin describes it as, it's like an ecclesia that meets once every two years. And we could sit down and talk for quite a long time with one another. And finding that there are people with similar situations as you, and yeah, we can help each other along the way. It was, um, it was fun times. You know that in two years, if the Lord hasn't returned, we're going to have this wonderful, joyful week again. I guess it's the closest I've probably ever felt to being in the kingdom. You were all on the same page sort of thing. Um, it was a taste of the kingdom, really. It really, yes, it was. A taste it of was. The kingdom. And people can say, you know, this is like what it will be in God's kingdom, being together with people who love you and you love. Metagong, me dream. Metagong, everybody else but me. We learnt that <laughs> laughter is part of worship because be you don't laugh at the memorial meeting much. Yes, Mittagong, interesting question. I remember being in Suva in uh, 1973 with my son Douglas and Roger and Linda, my daughter, my lovely wife Joan, and I thought, Mittagong, that'll be the day. Not, a, not during the meeting anyway, and not after that. <laughs> But at Mittagong, we laughed and laughed and laughed. Why? I can remember sitting there just for some of those nights and just laughing and laughing. That was quite a new thing to be able to do, to laugh like that. I'm so beautiful, don't you think? And Andrew Quixley uh, hogtailed me into doing that, so I've done a few little comedy skits. I'm pretty sure I remember things happening above the stage with heads or legs or something coming down above what was happening on the stage. Having a stage on which we could put quite brilliant productions like The Music Machine. How's the practice coming along? Terrific. They're going to be great. You're going to be really proud of your kids. They've done a great job. I do remember the musicals and the beautiful kids productions that were performed in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is ridiculous. Mittagong. <laughs> oh, that'll be the place to do after Birmingham. I went with a brother and sister in, in Britain and we had a wonderful preaching campaign in this extremely remote place, halfway <laughs> between Brazil and, and South Africa. Very remote. It, take, it took about four days to get there by sea. It's so remote. There's no airport, nothing. But we were invited to give some talks there, some Bible talks, and it was wonderful. Can I ask, wonderful. Chris, is there anyone on the island? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly we had different kinds of music.
had wonderful people who were able to put on musicals, so there was always a musical, and they were always quite sensational. I did the kids' musical with Rachel, which was great. I think we wrote it, I think we wrote the script and had songs in, I'm not sure now. Um, Rachel probably played by ear because she can do that. And those people put an enormous amount of effort into it, but the kids would never forget. You know, I so look forward to Wednesday night because I've probably been having a fairly stressful week and I haven't got to much and I know I'll be able to sit down on Wednesday night and laugh myself silly at Martin. <laughs> you can talk about your fairest mate from the coast to Tennessee. My little red rose of dear Bale is the only rose for me. I often find Thursday evenings at Mitternock the <laughs> serious part of the whole week. I like the talks, I like the presentations, I love the music and it's amazing that the quality and amount of music that's been produced uh, within our community has been so prolific really it just blows me away and the sad thing in getting older myself is that uh, you know, I can't sing like I used to in the good old days. that pandas gets is where that expression comes from. You can see here when we're looking at this panda, what I need to do is to take some samples here. We'll do a simple internal examination and then we'll take a stool sample. Yeah, we're just better in there. Speakers were taken off, Tim, and you know, they were the young people got going on all that. I'd been considered coming along and doing Mittagong, but uh, my wife Sheila said, No, no, leave it to the good British brothers. featuring none other than our very own Alan Clayton! Uh, we're running a taxi time schedule, sometimes erroneously pronounced schedule. Come now, Joseph. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me that your mother and I and your brothers are going to worship you? You don't understand, Father. These dreams I had, they were so real! Oh. Joseph. <laughs> Go to Shechem and see how your brothers and the sheep are faring, and then return to me. I think God, he's 
the sounds of our heartstrings rather than the sounds of our vocal cords. There's a lot of singing, a lot of um, a lot of praise, which is wonderful. Um, we've had some fantastic musicians in the, the last few years, which has certainly helped with with all the singing and everything, and people have really enjoyed that. that Mr. and Andrew Quixley got involved, unbeknownst to us. And got changed the Mill menu. Time. Did all sorts of huge funny things, came in dressed as a clown and did all sorts of tricks and I mean really made the, the nights and the well, not only night time, lunch time isn't that really so enjoyable. I'm not a poet so this song will never match But I've got and Luke Spongecake used to be the bell ringer and he just absolutely loved doing the bell ringing mm. and stuck with it for the whole time, all the middle gongs. Right on the dot. Yeah, right on the dot. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about Luke. Well, Luke, of course, was um, a young guy who was coming along, I suppose, quite, quite, quite as a young bloke, wanting to get involved with things. Loved to be involved with, loved a great sense of humour. Could hardly reach the bell, could he? Yeah, that's right, he was only small. <laughs> he, he loved Andrew Quixley, and he used to be a sort of a partner of Andrew Quixley on some of his nonsense. <laughs> but he was just determined that the job you gave him, he would do absolutely well. Well, uh, the campaign, yeah, seemed to be going, yeah, oh, very good. <laughs> Mum, of course, got run to the music, so we did the William Tell Overture, which I reckon is still in her house somewhere, the, the arrangement. So whatever instrument you played, from a recorded a mouth organ to Rex Winter on the violin, there was a part for you. We did the slow bit, the da di da 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 and then, of course, the gallop, which is the fun part. Um, Rex Winter played the violin in the chapel, and he, it was a thing called something about the farmyard, and he made the violin sound like chickens squawking. I think it was called Tweet Tweet the Canary. <laughs> when I play that piece, my well, I got some problems. <laughs> my grandfather was standing up there on the stage and he was sort of leaning on the rostrum and it was a beautiful rostrum that was sort of handcrafted out of local timber and it had a, a, a tapestry on the front of it and things. So it was quite, it was a beautiful thing. Anyway, the rostrum collapsed under him um, and it like splintered into pieces of timber and, and my grandfather collapsed dramatically in front of everybody onto the floor, um, which was a very memorable moment. Fortunately, he was okay. I stood up at, up at the microphone to announce Paul Taylor was going to sing the entrance of the Queen of Sheba. Oh, he was on stage all the time, like <laughs> upstaging or downstaging. Or... In the corner of my eye, I noticed someone got up from the first row. I moved over to find out what it was about and behind me was the most incredible crash on the ground and the frame that was holding the screen had been blown over by some draft coming out from the back of the stage and it missed me by a couple of feet. Some of you may know him as Stuart Richards. We know him as Stuart Richards. There's a number of people in the audience who've, who've commented how that they're terribly impressed with your Australian accent that you uh, put on whether we like it or not. <laughs> and what we thought we'd do is a little, little Australian accent test. I have a couple of roos loose in a top paddock. <laughs> I do. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. 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 I do. I do. And I've talked it. 
Bob, of course, did a lot. Bob O'Toole the, the was there with man. the music. I think of Uncle Bob and the music machine, and that's got to be a legacy of Mittagong. Um, I'm so tempted to sing, have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. He would make a recording of him playing and singing the music from something like the music machine. It's the line, see the little phrase thing above it. The school had apparently bought a Steinway, new Steinway piano, which was in there, and that was absolutely fantastic. Bob was playing, as you can imagine, and giving instructions on how we should sing. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Whether they sang or whether they sung what they said, I don't know, but we'll sing it at any rate. Right. Come in the fourth beat. One, two. The fact that we had a lovely little pipe organ there helped considerably in helping us to sing the hymns. Picking that Teach Me Thy Way hymn as being the, the hymn for, for Mittagong, you know, we sang that at the be beginning and the end of the school. And that's always stuck in your mind every time you, you sing it now. It's, it's just, it's back at Mittagong again. <laughs> A little bit of shush. A little bit of shush.